Welcome everyone to the Parrot Club July program. We're going to be doing Where in the World and Other Parrot Facts by myself, Amy Hopkins, president of the Parrot Club. So we will get started here. So the first species we're going to discuss is the budgie. And I put the scientific names up there, but you don't need to know that. And we're going to start asking some questions about them. So first question is, where are budgies from? Western hemisphere, which includes North, South, and Central America, Asia, mm -hmm. Africa, and I created the category called Austra Australasia Oceana, which includes Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, and islands. Uh, technically, Indonesia belongs with Asia, but for the purposes of talking about parrots, uh, you get a lot of birds that tend to be in the geographic area of Australia, Indonesia, and all those many, many hundreds of islands there. So I grouped those together. So that, that's the grouping you're going to be seeing on all the slides. So this is the first question. And D. Hey. Whoops. Here's the poll. Oh. So I want you to. <laughs> Oops. Okay. Everyone pick an answer, A, B, C, or D, Western Hemisphere, Asia, Africa, or Australasia. And we have six replies, seven replies. And see if anybody else is going to answer. Uh, okay, we're going to end the poll and share results. Now, can everybody see that then now? I just want to make sure. You should see six for Austral Australasia and one for Africa. All right. Does uh, can anyone tell me? Can you see the uh, can you see the poll results on the screen? Yes. Okay. Fantastic. So it's working. All right. So I'm gonna put that down, and the answer is Australasia. Um, we start off with a pretty easy question, um, but next question is where specifically? Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, or the Solomon Islands? And the Solomon Islands are right up in here. So let's put the poll back up. Okay, go ahead and answer. So Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, Solomon answers. And trust me, they will, they will get harder than this. So, <laughs> Okay, we have seven responses and let's see, share results. So six are for Australia, one for Solomon and, uh, Islands. And the answer is Australia. And this is a range map. They are in most of Australia. They tend to not be along the coast. Uh, the most of the population of Australia is the coasts. You see here Melbourne, Sydney, and Brisbane. So the reality is that most Australians don't actually see them in their day-to-day -day life when they're outside. You have to be in the drier, dustier areas of uh, more central Australia. And when um, Chris and I went to Australia, we did see them, but only um, very, very, very few outside of um, Alice Springs. So we were not lucky enough to see those huge flocks of budgies. So unfortunately. Okay, next question. Are there established feral budgie populations outside of Australia? And I'll bring the poll up. Okay, yes or no? Hey, yeah. Yeah, you can probably guess, uh, or maybe not. So, and we have six responses, seven responses, uh, six for yes and one for no. And there we go. And the answer is yes. You can probably guess by the fact that I asked that what the answer would be. The next question though was gonna be a little bit trickier. Where are there established feral budgie populations? Your choices are Texas, California, Florida, or Florida and Texas. And I will pull up. Okay. So this is a little trickier. Let's see what people are going to answer. Texas, California, Florida, or Florida and Texas. California, Florida, Texas. So now we're a little bit here. We've got California, we've got Florida, we've got Florida and Texas. And let's. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, we're kind of split. The majority say Florida and Texas, but followed by California or Florida. And the answer in this case is only Florida. Um, oh. It's a little bit surprising because a lot of the established parrot populations in that are in the US, feral birds, are, are also in Florida, or also in Texas and California. In this case, it appears to be only yes. Florida. The reason for that is unknown. Uh, it's, you know, up here uh, in, in New York, we do have a lot of budgies that escape or are released outside. So and they do seem to, to thrive a lot. Uh, people have reported budgies at their feeders for months on end, but I don't know if they really survive the winter. And um, I guess maybe there aren't enough to form a thriving population. Uh, and when I say population, I, I basically mean a breeding population. So you do get uh, birds, wild birds, born of these released captive uh, bred birds. So budgies, only Florida. If you go down to Florida, you can go take a look for them. Amy, so was that just about feral populations in the United States? like? Are there feral populations of budgies elsewhere in the world, like other than Australia, obviously, but like, you know, Japan, uh, you know, somewhere like that? Not that I could find a record of. I only found one for Florida. Doesn't mean they're oh. different, but not widely known. Okay. Uh, Gail okay. writes Florida is very human, so I'm surprised. Uh, very good point, Gail. I mean, the Budgies in Australia I found in very dry areas, not in humid areas. So, and yes, Florida is very humid. Um, it's kind of a mystery why they're not in Texas and California yet. I do say yet because chances are at some point they will be. Maybe there just weren't enough released for them to find each other and reproduce. Okay, what color are wild budgies? This, this is wild budgies, blue, white, green, yellow, blue, white, or green, yellow, or multiple colors. And we'll get the poll up. So those are your choices, blue, white, green, yellow. And these are wild birds. We have seven answers. And most people pick green and yellow. We also have one multiple colors and one blue or white. And the answer is green, yellow. Um, that this is wild birds. If you've ever been to Australia, you probably only saw wild green and yellow birds. Unless you were someplace like Sydney or Melbourne on the coast where they're not natively found, but there may be ones that have escaped there that are other colors that you might have thought were wild birds because you were in Australia. Keep in mind though um, that even wild birds will occasionally have a color mutation. And this is why we do have birds that are different colors or different patterns, because every once in a while, there's an error made. Think of albinoism. Um, you get people or animals that are pure white with red eyes because you have a color mutation. So if you uh, have enough wild birds, you're gonna have birds with other, other mutations. Like Amazon parrots, you know, some Amazon parrots will, will come in a blue coloration. Those, most of those are captive bred, but there is the occasional wild blue Amazon because there's an error in processing when the, uh, when the DNA is reproduced. Uh, so that's how we get different color mutations in captivity because every once in a while there's a mistake and then they take that color and they amplify it and they breed it till it's a regularly occurring color in captivity. All right, and every bird we're gonna ask this question because I think it's important to know, um, but you may not know these. What International Union for Conservation of Nature or IUCN red list categories budget? In this case, least concern, vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. And this is in the wild. So you can go ahead and answer. Okay, we have six answers, so we'll end that. And uh, the majority said vulnerable, and then one person said least concerned, and one said endangered. And the answer is actually least concern. 
There are lots of budgies that are not considered of concern. Now, Australia many years ago stopped the, the exportation of their native parrots, so it's illegal. Doesn't mean it doesn't ever happen, but they do keep tight control of it and they're able to because it's an island country. So a lot of birds have rebounded, even though previously they were uh, hunted close to extinction. I don't think a budgie was ever in that category because budgies, uh, I think a lot of you know, reproduce like crazy in captivity. And they're so easy to breed that it just wasn't worthwhile taking more from the wild. One caveat is that we don't know the population. And you're gonna see that a lot in this presentation that you'll see a category come up, but we have absolutely no idea how many they're in the wild. So a lot of times when they make a designation, it's based on other things that they know. So let's say they don't know how many of a particular bird there is, but they know that they all live in a certain area and that area is being logged and their uh, nests are disappearing. So they'll make a guess that that bird is probably endangered or critically endangered just based on what's happening to the habitat. But as I said, the reality is we, we don't know, we don't actually have good estimates for a lot of these birds. And when we do have an estimate, I'll, I'll show you that. But all right, let's move on to the kakapo. Okay, so first question then is, where is the kakapo from? This is a little bit harder, so we'll see if people know. Western Hemisphere, Asia, Africa, or uh, Australasia. Okay. And we have seven answers. Six people say Australasia and one from Africa. And the answer is Australasia. Let's drill down a little bit. Where specifically? Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, or the Solomon Islands? Okay, we have six answers. And most of you knew that the answer was New Zealand. And if you see here, this is a range map. They are found just in the very southern tip of New Zealand. And uh, that's not where they're native to, that's where they were relocated. Australia, I mean, sorry, New Zealand's done a very good job of creating uh, island refuges that are free of rats and stoats and cats and other animals that kill all the native New Zealand birds. So we have a number of species that have been relocated to islands where they are free from predator attacks. Originally, kakapo were found all through the southern island of New Zealand. Oops. Okay, what's true about kakapo? There are fewer than 100 left in the world. They can fly only short distances. They're the heaviest parrot in the world. Or they are diurnal, active during the day. Only one choice is correct here. Though they all, all four sound like they're correct. So we'll see what people think. Okay, anybody else want to guess? There we go, we're up to six, all right. Okay, so most people said they're the heaviest pair in the world, but we also have a couple people saying they're fewer than a hundred left and they can fly only short distances. Well, until recently there were fewer than a hundred left, but there's been a tremendous um, success with breeding them over the last five years or so. And we're currently up to 248, which is phenomenal. Uh, we were in double digits for a number of years when the, re the reco recovery effort um, first began. So uh, I'd say probably only maybe less than 10 years ago, there were fewer than 100 left in the world. They can't fly at all. They're one of the flightless birds in the world, along with the uh, flightless uh, cormorant, um, 
birds like cassowaries, emus, rheas, ostriches. So there aren't very many flightless birds. Oh, penguins, of course. And uh, they're, they are nocturnal birds. And they're found on, right now, they're on four small islands in the south of New Zealand. So very good. And which IUCN red list category is the kakapo? You can probably guess this looking at that, but. Okay, choices are least concerned, vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered. Okay, very good. You all, you all correctly guess that they are critically endangered. Absolutely. Okay, well, let's move on to the monk parakeet, also known as Quaker parakeets. That's a little cutie there. All right, so first question, where are they located? Again, choices are Western Hemisphere, Asia, Africa, and Australasia. Okay, and about half of you thought Western Hemisphere, and then we're split between Africa and Austral Australasia. And the answer is Western Hemisphere. Okay, next, which part of the Western Hemisphere? North America, Central America, South America, or Central and South America? This is where they're native to, not, not the ones in your backyard, but where they're originally native to. Ooh, got a lot more answers on this one. Okay, we're split here between South America and the majority said Central and South America. And the answer is just South America. It's a little bit hard because a lot of the parrot species are in both Central America and South America, but monks are just from South America. And now this is for the, the experts. We're gonna drill down even further. What, which country are they native to? Chile, which is here along the coast, Argentina, also down south, Peru, which is up here, and then Guyana, which is all the way up here. Again, Chile, Argentina, Peru, and Guyana. We don't know. <laughs> all right, when the poll there. And the majority said Argentina, which is correct. Uh, here's the range map. They also go a little bit into Brazil, Uruguay, and Paraguay, and a tiny little bit of Bolivia. So this is their native range. All right, now, monk parakeets have spread around the world. Where are they not found? So of these four choices, which is the one they're not in? Spain, Easter Island, Japan, or South Africa? So th this is a tricky one. And whoops, I'm sorry, I need to relaunch that. There we go. A is Spain, B is Easter Island, C, Japan, D is South Africa. Where are they not found? Japan. <laughs> And I don't expect people to get this one right, but. <laughs> I saw them in the wild in uh, Buenos Aires and also in Spain. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I also saw them in Spain. So I knew that one. The other is a lot trickier. So uh, majority of people said they're not found in Easter Island. A um, couple people picked Japan and South Africa. And the answer is South Africa. This is an approximate map of where they're found, but they're probably other places. They are found all through the US, Mexico, Canada, all through the Middle East, South Korea, Singapore, Kenya, Japan, the Caribbean, all through Europe. Um, they are actually found in Easter Island, which is 2,300 miles west of mainland Chile. Uh, they're, it's very remote, there's nothing near it. Um, I didn't find an explanation for why they're in Easter Island. The only thing 
I can uh, think of is that someone must have brought them there and released them and they reproduced because there's no way that, um, you know, parrots fly, but they're not the strongest flyers. They're not like the Arctic terns, which travel 25,000 miles a year. There's no way a monk parakeet is flying from uh, South America all the way out to Easter Island. So they have to have been brought there. Um, Japan has a lot of feral parrots because people buy them and then they get escape or get released. So I think that's why Japan shows up on all these lists. Um, but you can see pretty much uh, they're not listed in Australia, but that doesn't mean they're not there yet. And of course, Antarctica doesn't have them. And I didn't include South America here because they're native to South America, but obviously they're found all through, through South America. Uh, so yeah, this is kind of shocking. They haven't made it to South Africa. That's that's pretty much it. Okay, what's unique about oops, what's unique about monk parakeets? This is an easy one. So we'll see. They're migratory. They build stick nests. They are polygamous. Uh, so more than one partner, or they produce one to two eggs per year. Yep. I think most people get this one right, but not necessarily. Certainly anybody that lives with the monk parakeet will get this right. Okay. So the majority says they build stick nests and we also have answers about their phlegmas and their migratory. They build stick nests. Uh, they, they are known for this. They're the only parrot that does this. I actually took this photo myself. This is in uh, New Haven. Uh, if those of you who remember back, <clears throat> I remember how many years ago when United Illuminating decided to murder the monk parakeets. And this is a nesting platform that Mark Johnson of Foster Parrots designed along with us. That's how we first met him as a club. And we put it up in someone's front yard with their permission to see if the monk parakeets would build a nest here rather on the transformers. And as you can see, they did. There were a number of monk parakeets in here. I have other pictures where it's covered with monk parakeets, but they build these enormous stick nests. They don't migrate uh, at all. They are monogamous and um, most parrots are monogamous. And they produce four to egg, eight eggs a year. And uh, the thing about monk parakeets, which is interesting, is that oh, but actually I'm gonna walk. discuss it when we get to another species, Never mind. And uh, what I I use CN um, red list categories among parakeets. These concerned, vulnerable, endangered, work quickly in nature. Then we got to the nursing home. Oh, there's somebody talking. Uh, if they're not talking about the presentation, I'd appreciate it if you would mute. Thank you. Okay. So which uh, red list category are they? And Everybody correctly identified them as least concern. Oh, and I forgot population, but population is unknown. Oh, there it is, population unknown. Okie doke. All righty. Let's move on to another species, the palm cockatoo. Beautiful bird. Where are they from? Western hemisphere, Asia, Africa, or Australasia? Okay, uh, most people identify them as from Australasia. We have a couple from the Western Hemisphere and Africa. There we go. And the correct answer is Australasia. Then the question is, where specifically? Australia, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, or all the above? And I'll just note, by the way, for geopolitical reasons, this island is actually made up of two countries, Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. So um, you do get birds that are present. It's not like birds come up to the border and go, whoops, I'm not going to cross. But um, so that's that's why this looks that way. Okay.
Okay, everyone correctly answered all of the above. And this is the range map. If primarily found on this island of Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and just a little tip here, the tip of Australia, right there, it's called uh, Cape York. So they're found there. What's true about palm cockatoos? They're, they are members of the white cockatoo subfamily, Cockatoonae. They have the largest mm -hmm. beak of the parrots, that's B. C is both male, whoops, males and females drum with sticks. Mm -hmm. And uh, drum with sticks or seed pods against trees. Or D, they lay only one egg per year. So they're members of the white cockatoo family. They have the largest beak. Males and females both drum or they lay only one egg per year. And to see if anybody else has answered, but this is the first time we have all four categories represented. Okay, so the majority said both males and females drum with sticks or seed pods against trees, but we have uh, one person answering all the others. And it's actually A, they're members of the white cockatoo subfamily. So first, uh, they do have very large beaks, but the hyacinth macaw has a larger beak. That's only one they're secondary to. Oh. Only the males drum, it's part of their um, mating ritual. And there've been a lot of studies about that because not only do they drum, but they actually create the drums, sticks themselves. So they will take sticks and then manipulate them and carve them to be just the perfect drumstick, which is an example of parrots using tools or creating tools. So um, it's been, most of the studies have focused on other cockatoos like Goffin's cockatoos, creating tools to do various things. But palm cockatoos were recognized very early as one of the uh, rare birds, even rare parrots that actually creates tools to accomplish what they want. In terms of eggs, they actually lay one egg only every other year, which is very unusual. Most birds will lay eggs every year. And this is what makes it critically important to preserve palm cockatoos because their reproductive rate is so low. Now let's go back to member of the white cockatoo family. So at first glance, that looks kind of ridiculous. It turns out, so cockatoos have three families or subfamilies. One subfamily is the cockatiel. It has only the cockatiel in it. And second subfamily is what are called the black cockatoos. And anyone who's been to Australia knows there's a whole group of, they're called black cockatoos. And there's actually a hyphen between black and cockatoo. I think there are five or six of them. And then there are the white cockatoos, which is everybody else, including the pink cockatoos like Rosie and uh, 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 the Leadbetter's cockatoo, which is salmon and white and everything. Um, so why are they members of that? Hard to say, but they're actually more closely related to the white cockatoos than they are to the black cockatoos, despite the fact that their feathers are black. So just one of those things, a little bit tricky question. And which IUCN category are they? Least concern, vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered? Okay, we're kind of split here mostly between endangered and critically endangered with one least concern. And surprisingly, they're actually least concerned. It's really kind of strange because there aren't, we don't think there are that many of them. The population is unknown, but uh, the how they create the categories, a little bit mysterious to me, but very complicated. It not only has to do with how many of a, a bird or another animal there are, but it also has to do with um, what factors are affecting their ability to survive long-term, be it trapping or habitat or global warming or whatever. And even though there aren't enormous numbers of palm cockatoos, they're not felt to be under any severe threats. So they're not, they don't tend to be trapped for the bird trade or uh, their habitat seems to be stable. So I think that's why they're classified as least concerned. Uh, not that that means that there are 100,000 of them, but 
that that's just the way it goes. All right. So this one's kind of interesting. So let's move on to the sun tanya, also known by the rest of the world as sun parakeet. And I should point out that a lot of the times the names that we use in aviculture are not the names that they're generally known by. So the, the term conure is not a scientific name. It's an aviculture name. So in the scientific world, all the birds that we call conures are generally known as parakeets. And of course, we call budgies parakeets, which is totally nonsensical because they're they're not considered parakeets at all. But that in the rest of the world, if you say a parakeet, usually it refers to something like the uh, ringneck parakeet. Uh, if you say parakeet and you're in another country, they'll assume it's that, not not the budgie. All right, so let's pull up the poll. Where are sun conures from? Western Hemisphere, Asia, Africa, Australasia. South America, West Okay, most of you said Western Hemisphere, and you would be correct. Which part of the Western Hemisphere? North America, Central America, South America, or Central and South America? Okay, we're evenly split between South America and Central and South America. And just as with the Hmong parakeets, the answer is again, South America. Doesn't mean it will always, that will always be the answer, but it was in this case. Now let's drill down even further. Where in South America are they native to? Chile, again, down here. Brazil takes up a good deal of South America. Guiana, little country up here or Brazil and Guiana? Brazil. Okay, uh, slightly more of you said Brazil than Brazil and Guiana. And the answer is Brazil and Guiana, but it's not like they're found all over the Brazil. It's they're found in this tiny little area at the very tip of Brazil and going into Guiana. So it's really a very small area that they are native to. And we're doing the, this one a little out of the usual order. So what red list category is the sun conure? Are they least concerned, vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered? And you'll find out soon why why I'm doing it in this order. Okay, we're split between least concerned and endangered with one person uh, doing picking vulnerable. They are endangered. Ooh, we do, we do have a population estimate of only a thousand to twenty, basically twenty five hundred in the wild. And you'll soon find out why. But first we have to answer this question. Which bird is not related to sun conures? A, now remember conure and parakeet are, are interchangeable. So answers are A, golden conure, B, gende conure, C, golden capped conure, or D, sulfur-breasted parakeet. This, this one is very tricky. Let, let's people are will, willing to try and answer for this one. All right, we'll end that there. And we're just split all over the place. Okay, so this is what's going on with these birds. It's a very interesting story. I actually wrote a little article about this. 
back in 2008, which is why I wanted to include this. So here's the golden conure, and some of you may have seen them. Uh, they actually, despite the color, they're more yeah. into macaws than conure, and despite their name, they but they they they're more macaw-like than conure-like. Here's the Gende conure, which is very similar to the um, sun conure, except the back is green. So they kind of look like juvenile sun conures. Golden cap conure, and Ginny has one of these. Um, the coloration is different, but again, they have that beautiful white eye ring. And here's the sulfur-breasted parakeet. So on the right is what we think of as the sun conure, and the left is the sulfur-breasted parakeet which is actually a lot even duller looking than this picture would lead you to believe. So there's no orange on the breast, the, the yellow is much duller and there's no white eye ring. So back before 2005, these were thought to be one species and they were just called sun conures. And an ornithologist was doing some research. He was going around to different museums and looking at specimens. And he realized that there were two different birds that were both <laughs> They were both being called uh Ron, okay. Um yeah. Oh, I was just telling you to mute because we were hearing a lot of background there. Oh, I just put the I'm sorry, I just put the phone down no in the wrong place. Uh so they were this ornithologist realized there were two different species. And be, at, up until that time, they were considered to be a species of least concern. But then they realized there were two different species and it was really the one on the right, what we think of as the sun conure, that was basically being hunted to extinction. And uh, it, it's not been a habitat issue. It's been that they were all being captured. They were all being captured for the pet trade. You say, so anyone who's met sun conure knows how, how beautiful they are. So the sulfur-breasted parakeets are also in Brazil, but it's much more common. Once they end up slinging the species into two in 2008, the sun, sun conure went from being a species of least concern to being endangered. Because instead of being, you know, say 100,000 of the birds, now we know there are 1,000 to 2,500 of them left. So that's how this all evolves. And because they ended up slinging the species, um, procedures were put into place to mitigate they're being captured. So until that time, they were captured freely. But when the Brazilian government realized what was going on, there was a moratorium placed on trapping this bird, the sun conure. This bird, by the way, the name it used to be Pintoy, named after the orn an ornithologist, and now it's Maculata. Uh, so if that hadn't happened, it's quite possible that this particular bird on the right might have gone extinct in the wild by now. So very interesting conservation story. All right, let's move on to the ring neck parakeet. The rest of the world calls it the rose ring because it, you know, sort of a reddish black ring around its neck, but we call it the ringed neck. So first question again, where, oops, where is it native? Oh, never stop sharing that. Where is it native to? Not where is it found, but where is it native to? Western hemisphere, Asia, Africa, or Asia and Africa. A little bit different than the previous question we asked about that. Okay, we're split here between Asia and Asia and Africa. And the answer is Asia and Africa. Oops. Well, you know what, I think, uh, oh, there we go. Yeah, you'll see the range map in a minute. I It works into another question. All right, like the uh, monk parakeet, we're going to be asking this question again. Where are they not native to? Not native to. And this isn't feral. This is where they're not native to. So India, Myanmar. So first one is India. Second is Nigeria. Third is Myanmar, fourth is Egypt. Is this monk parakeet? No, so this is the ring neck parakeet. Where are they right. not? You said monk parakeet. Did, yeah, I, I, this was like the monk parakeet question we did earlier. Um, where are they not native to? 
So Nigeria, Egypt, India, Myanmar. Okay, the majority picked Egypt. And that's correct. They're not native to Egypt. This is their native range. Interesting, right across the middle of Africa from west to east, all the way across. Also India and Myanmar. Um, these are distinct native populations. Uh, don't ask me why they're not found in the Middle East in between these regions, because I do not know, but they're not in Egypt, but they're all across, across Africa and Asia. Now, like the Hmong parakeets, they have spread around the world. Where are they not found? And I, by what I told you previously, we ruled out one of them, I'm sure. Where are they not found? South Africa, Japan, Israel, or Brazil. So they're found in three of these countries and not in the fourth. And these are the feral birds. This is not their native range, but where have they spread to? Okay, the majority picked Israel. And you would be wrong. The answer is Brazil. So I couldn't find a head-to-head -head comparison of the monks and the ringnecks, but I think the ringnecks are the most widely spread parrot in the world. So they are in South Asia. I'm sorry, South Africa. They are in Japan. They're, they're found in most of the world. They're in, these guys are in Australia, New Zealand. I listed some of the countries, but they're viable feral populations in, in the US and Florida and California. Again, all through Western Europe, Turkey, the Middle East, maybe because the Middle East is between the two native populations. Also, they're in South Africa, they're in Chan, they're in Rosie, they're in Hong Kong, uh, they're in Thailand, they're in the Philippines, Australia, New Zealand. And when I add it up, it turns out they're in 73 countries or territories at last count. So that's pretty phenomenal. Uh, they're in Venezuela, but there's no record of them being in Brazil yet. But just the fact that they're in Venezuela means it's highly likely they will be spreading through South, um, South America. Um, next question, which is true about ringneck parakeets? While commonly found, they're not deemed agricultural pests. That's A. B, they compete with bats for nesting sites and will even kill bats. C, both green and blue are native body colors. And D, with their size, they don't usually have to fear predation by other animals. Anybody else want willing to take a swing at this one? There we go. Okay, basically we have all the answers. All right, and this was kind of scary. So they actually kill bats. Um, they are direct threat to Europe's largest bats called the Greater Noctule. They kill and um, they attack and kill the adults and take over their nesting sites because the bats nest in trees. And since the ringneck parakeets have moved throughout Europe, there's been an 80% decline in these bats. So the, uh, these beloved uh, parrots of ours may actually be pushing bats towards extinction, which is a pretty horrible thing. Uh, green is the only native body color. They are agricultural pests. Uh, now, interestingly, the monk parakeets in South America are considered agricultural pests, but that's one of the things that's been claimed against them in, in the United States, but it's never been shown to be, be the case. Monk par parakeets don't basically chew up crops. Uh, Ringneck parakeets on the other hand do. And here's a picture. This is very common in India, so where they have these stack, uh, sacks of grain stacked up. And they'll be swarmed over by thousands of ringneck parakeets, actually chewing holes in the grain sack and eating the grain. So they consider a major uh, force um, 
a major danger to agricultural crops. They uh, are attacked by hawks and things like that. So they they do they are not the tiniest birds, but they do get picked off by by hawks and stuff. Interestingly, so if you remember back to when the monk I showed you the slide with the monk parakeets in the nest, monk parakeets are not felt to compete with our native birds here in the U.S. because they don't take over nesting cavities. They build their own stick nests, so they don't take nests from anyone else. They don't take food. They don't from other birds. They do come to feeders, but um, even places down south where there are larger concentrations of them, despite their being illegal in many places and despite all the bad rap against them, monk parakeets have really not never been shown in the U.S. to affect other birds, to affect agricultural, really to affect anything other than, of course, the um, the transformers, which is a major problem for them. In South America, the monk parakeets do attack crops. Ringneck parakeets are a totally different animal, though. They do compete with other birds for nesting sites. They compete with bats. They do kill. Uh, they kill other birds. They kill bats. They do devastate crops. Uh, they are found in urban areas, but they're also found out in the uh, rural areas where they will devastate crops. So. Despite the fact that we love our ringneck parakeets very much, they are very devastating to native ecologies. They're even in Hawaii where they're devastating our Hawaiian birds, many of which are very much on the brink of extinction. So there are culling programs where they kill monk parakeets and ringneck parakeets in many places, including in Spain, as Maureen mentioned. Um, but as much as... Uh, it's a controversial topic and people can't stand the thought of killing parrots. The reality is ringneck parakeets are very devastating to native ecologies in many places around the world. So unfortunately, monk parakeets get lumped in with them. All right, so which red list category are they in? Least concerned, vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered? Okay, everybody answered least concerned. And that is correct. We don't know the population, but given the way they've expanded, uh, there's, there's no way that they would be anything other than of least concern. Okay, let's move on to the lovebird. Now we call this bird the peach-faced lovebird and everyone else calls it the rosy-faced lovebird, just so you know. Very pretty little bird. I'm using lovebird in this case as a stand-in for kind of all the lovebirds because there, there are quite a few species of them. So this may be a little trickier, but where do we find lovebirds? Western Hemisphere, Asia, Africa, or Australasia? I don't know if anyone here has a lover, then you're, you're probably better equipped to, to answer the question. But. Okay, the majority said Asia, and we have one each for Africa and Australasia. And the answer is Africa. And a lot of people don't know that. So we're going to drill down just a little bit and say, which country are they native to? So we've got Namibia down here in the south, Egypt in the northeast, Morocco in the northwest, and Kenya in the east. And if you don't have a clue, go ahead and take a guess. Hey, the majority said Kenya. And the answer is actually Namibia. So this is where the lovebirds are here in South, Southwest Africa, just north of South Africa. They also go just a tiny bit into South Africa and up here in Angola. But this is where they are. Namibia is, by the way, very famous for its deserts and its sand dunes. And a lot of... Um, a lot of movies are filmed in Namibia. 
Tracy, I'm pretty sure Dune was filmed in Mi Namibia because they have some of the most spectacular sand dunes in the world. Okay. Next, are there established peach face lovebird populations outside of Africa? Yeah, for the pull up. Your choices are yes or no. And you can probably guess the answer to this, or I wouldn't have asked it. And of course there are, yes, there are. Where are there peach face lovebird populations in the US? Our answers are Texas, California, Florida, or Arizona. All very hot, dry places. Okay, four people were willing to take a guess. Oh, there we go, five. All right, and most people answered Texas. Answer is actually Arizona, and specifically, it's a colony in Phoenix. And not just peach face lovebirds, there are other lovebirds there too. They all seem to have gathered in, in Phoenix. Again, it's felt to be some, it was felt to be some kind of a release or escapee population that for some reason established in Phoenix. Uh, possibly because Phoenix is probably the hottest place in the country. It always seems to be around Phoenix, seems to set all the records other than for uh, Death Valley. So uh, Namibia is very hot. Maybe that's why I don't really know. And let's find out something about the lovebirds, which is not true about feral peach-faced lovebirds in Phoenix. A, they live in cacti. B, they come to bird feeders. C, they live only in urban downtown. D, they perch on air conditioning vents to uh, basically cool their jets. All right, the majority says they stop or uh, they perch on air conditioning vents. Answer is actually that they live in urban downtown. Um, they, they live both in downtown and out in the rural areas. They do come to bird feeders, which must be very, very cool. There are, if you just Google it, there are tons of pictures of them perched on air conditioning vents to stay cool. And uh, probably a lot of you, anybody who has a fan in the house or possibly, uh, you know, portable air conditioner, uh, people have certainly, you know, shared pictures I've seen of their parrots sitting on air conditioners or fans to get the cool air. Uh, what's really cool is they live in cacti. And I had to, there, there are a bunch of photos. I had to, all the photos for this, I had to find, had to be copyright free so we, so I don't get into trouble. Um, but there are lots of great pictures. They nest in cacti. So they either, I don't know if they make the holes themselves or there are woodpeckers that nest in cacti and there are wrens. So they may be using other people or other birds nests. But there were all these pictures online. It's worth Googling because you also see the other types of lovebirds there, like Fisher's lovebirds. But they make their nests inside cacti. So all these great pictures of lovebirds peeking out cacti. And here's a pair. Here's the male down here and the, the female there. And I don't know if anyone here has actually seen it. I'd, I'd love to hear about it. It must be so cool to, to see this. Um, I've been to Phoenix several times, but um, I don't know if they were there then, or I probably didn't know about it then, but I would love to go see the lovebirds in the cacti because it's just the cutest thing. All right, which red list category is the lovebird? Least concerned, vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered? Okay, mostly we have least concern with one vulnerable. And they are least concern. Again, we don't know the population. All right, orange-bellied parrot. Beautiful, beautiful bird. Uh, 
Unlikely anyone here has actually seen it. And where are they from? Western Hemisphere, Asia, Africa, or Australasia? Okay, everybody said Australasia, and you would be correct. Where specifically? Australia, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, or all the above? Okay, most people said Australia. And that is the correct answer. You can see they, um, you'll see more of this in, in another slide, but they're found here on Tasmania and along the coast of Australia. What is true about the orange-bellied parrot? They're one of only two migratory parrot species. A, B, males and females look alike. C, captive breeding has not yet been successful. D, they fly back and forth between Australia and New Zealand every year. Only two people willing to make a guess so far. Oh, there's three and four. And five. Okay, we're basically split across the board. A little bit tricky. So they're one of only two migratory parrot species, the other being the swift parrot. Um, they breed here in Tasmania, and then they fly across the Bass Strait here, the both of them do, to southern Australia. The males and females do look different. And captive breeding is the only thing currently keeping them from going extinct. Unfortunately, most released juveniles do not survive the flights across the Bass Strait, and they haven't yet quite figured out how to improve this. But this is, it's critical to them that they fly back and forth. They winter and whatever they need to eat here is in Southern Australia, and they need to be in um, Southern Tasmania. Uh, captive breeding has been very successful or as successful as it can be. So back, um, I don't remember the year, I have to look that up. They, they took a number of them back into captivity and they've been producing juveniles. So every year they release a bunch of juveniles from the captive breeding along with a few that are still um, there. And there's a high mortality rate with them. One of the biggest problems is they both breed in this very narrow area in Tasmania which has a lot of old growth forest. And for some reason, the Australian government has not restricted logging there. So there's tremendous logging there, cutting down the few remaining trees. And if those trees are gone, the spe both species will go extinct. And for some reason, there's not been a moratorium on logging those particular trees, which just sort of boggles the mind. Another problem is the uh, native possums, which are not related to our what we call possums are opossums. Their possums are a completely different species. They're marsupials, and they just love to eat the birds. So they, with the swift parrots, they've created these uh, specialized nest boxes that close shut at, uh, they close at dusk and they open at dawn and the parrots are sealed in there at night because that's when the possums come around. And then after sunrise, they unseal so the birds can come out and look for food and the possums are asleep then. And that has been quite successful so far, but um, th this has been a huge problem. They were down to double digit birds. Um, and I think that may be on another slide, but they almost went extinct at one point. So you can probably guess the answer to this one, which I which read this category is the orange bellied parrot. Least concerned, vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered. Okay. And obviously they are critically endangered. 
there are around 100. Well, I see conflicting numbers. I see 140 birds left in the wild, but I also see mentioned only about 70 to 74 fly across the Bass Strait. So it's possible that each year only around 70 survive. There were a low of 14 birds in 2017, but only two were female. If those two females had died, that would have been it for the species. Uh, so again, it's a, the captive breeding is the only thing keeping them alive. The wild population is not sustainable as is now. Every year they have to put captive birds into that wild population. Okay, thick-billed parrot. And uh, I think we only have a couple left, but here's the thick-billed parrot, beautiful bird. And I should mention, by the way, if you want to see a thick-billed parrot, the Queen Zoo um, on, in Queens, New York, has a beautiful population of them. I've been there and seen them. So that's probably your only opportunity to actually see a thick-billed parrot. So where are thick-billed parrots from? Western Hemisphere, Asia, Africa, or Australasia. Okay, majority said Western Hemisphere, and you are correct. Which part of the Western Hemisphere? North America, Central America, South America, or Central and South America? I don't expect anyone to get this one right, so we'll see. <laughs> Okay, everyone said South America or Central and South America. And you would all be wrong. They're actually from North America. Which country do you find thick billed parrots now? And this is currently United States, Canada, Mexico, or United States and Mexico? Okay, we're basically split between Mexico and United States and Mexico. And the answer is Mexico. This is their current range. They found it here along the mountains here in the Western part of Mexico. Now, in which country were they originally found? Mexico, United States, Mexico and United States or Mexico, US and Canada? Okay, Casper here between Mexico and the United States and plus or minus Canada. And the answer is Mexico and the United States. So everyone thinks of the Carolina parakeet as our only native parrot, but actually the thick-billed parrots were also native to the United States. And here somebody has plotted them. They were originally found in Arizona, New Mexico, and, Te and Texas. And there are even reports of them uh, venturing as far north as Utah. They were last seen in the U.S. in the 1930s, and there were attempts to reintroduce them to Arizona because they're natively found just over the border from Arizona into uh, Mexico. But uh, attempts in the 1980s and 1990s were unsuccessful, and the problem is in Arizona there are a lot of hawks, and the birds were, I think, hard released, so they were basically just kind of tossed out there, and they were all picked off by hawks. So there have not been any further attempts to reintroduce them because they don't really know what to do to teach the birds how to avoid hawks. So unfortunately, um, that's, that's actually when we lost our last native bird. It wasn't the Car our native parrot, it wasn't the Carolina parakeet, it was the thick-billed parrot. But again, if you get a chance, go down to the Queen Zoo. And which red list category are they? Least concerned, vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered? Okay, and the majority said endangered. And the answer is endangered. There are only 804, an estimated 840 to 2,800 of them, which you would think would make them critically endangered, but they're not because they're locally not that uncommon. 
uh, one of the big problems with Mexico course is that they like to trap everything for the pet trade. Okay, Eclectus parrot. And I wrote Eclectus species, and you'll see why. So where are Eclectus, Eclectus native to? Western hemisphere, Asia, Africa, or Australasia? Fairly common in captivity, but not certainly not as common as a lot of the other species. And we're kind of split here between Africa and Australasia. And the answer is Australasia. Where are they not found? So we have the Solomon Islands, East Timor, Indonesia, and Papua New Guinea. Which country are they not found in? Okay, we're kind of split here. And the answer is East Timor. Uh, this map shows you species and subspecies. So they're found all through here, all these various islands, for some reason not in East Timor, which is right here. And they're even found a little bit in Australia. It's called the Iron Range, again, right at the tip, near where the palm cockatoos are. Whoops, there we go. And which is true about eclectic species? A, there are two species, that's not counting subspecies, but there are two species. B, uh, males and females were once thought to be different species. C, males are more colorful than females. And D, males and females both feed the chicks. Okay, and... The majority of you knew that males and females were once thought to be different species. So there are actually four current existing species of Eclectus with a fifth that's gone extinct. They all look pretty similar. The males are mostly green and the females are bright red and purple. Sometimes it's just a little bit yellow. And originally explorers thought they were different species because they were so differently colored. Uh, the four existing species are the Moluccan, the Sumba, the Tanimbar, and the Papuan. And what happens is the females hole up in the nest hole and they kind of seal themselves in with the chicks and the males bring the food back for the chicks. And it's hypothesized that the males aren't as colorful because they need to stay more hidden from predators, you know, all the various hawks and things. But interestingly, under UV light, they apparently do glow much more brightly. The predators don't see in UV, so they don't see the brightness, but the females do see the extra brightness, which probably helps with mate selection. The females are thought to be so brightly colored because they apparently uh, fight quite vigorously with other females for prime nesting sites. So the color is used to serve as a warning signal to them. And which, so because there are four species, this one we're asking a little bit differently, which, which uh, red list category are they not found in? Least concerned, vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered? Okay, we're split between least concerned and critically endangered. And the answer is critically endangered. So you can see here, Moluccan and Papuan are of least concern. Tanimbar is vulnerable. And oops, the bottom of the screen is blocked off here, but Sumba is also considered in danger. That's one with the lowest amounts of them. Okay, Senegal parrot. Where are Senegal parrots from? Again, Western Hemisphere, Asia, Africa, Australasia. Ooh. People know more about this bird than I thought. And the majority of you said Africa, and you are right. And then which part? East, west, north, or south?
Okay, and we're cost split here between west and south. And the answer is west. They're found here across this whole region here, which includes Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Ghana, Benin, Togo, Guinea, some other countries, and of course, Senegal. And even though they have the name Senegal, I, oops, about to share there. Uh, I think not everybody actually realizes that the name Senegal parrot comes from the country Senegal, which is right here in Western Africa. Um, I obviously, I did not put the African gray in this quiz because obviously I couldn't ask where they're from, but I thought I could get away with it with the Senegal parrot. Oops. And then stop sharing, okay. All right, which is true about Senegal parrots? A, they're sexually dimorphic. The males and females look different. B, they're mostly found in urban areas. C, their diet is mostly seeds and grains. And D, chicks don't open their eyes until two to three weeks after hatching. So A, sexually dimorphic, B, urban areas, D, seeds and grains, D, chicks don't open their eyes for two to three weeks. Okay, most of you picked their diet is mostly seeds and grains. And that's not true. So males and females do look alike. They are birds of the open woodland and savanna. Their diet is mostly fruit with a little bit of seed, but their chicks don't open their eyes until two to three weeks after hatching. So I'm not sure how that compares to other parrots, but it just seemed like a really long time until their eyes open. Uh, and if you do have a Senegal parrot, knowing that their diet is mostly food is really important because fruit should be a good amount of their diet. Uh, of course, if you feed them pellets, they'll have the various nutrients in there. But if you do have a Senegal, they probably do enjoy fruit very much. Not necessarily the same fruit though that they eat in the wild because the African fruits are probably very different, but uh, feel free to um, give your bird various different fruits to see what they like. Okay, and which red list category are they? Least concerned, vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered? Okay, most people pick vulnerable. And the answer is least concern. But once again, we don't know how many there are. So a lot of times this data is hampered by the fact that we don't know how many birds there are. All right, the umbrella cockatoo, also known as the white cockatoo. Where are they from? Western hemisphere, Asia, Africa, Australasia. Okay, all of you correctly identified them as from Australasia. And then where specifically? Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, or Solomon Islands? A little bit harder. Okay, most of you guessed Australia. The answer is actually Indonesia. Uh, a lot of the cockatoos, a lot of the cockatoos come from Australia, but a lot of them come from Indonesia. And specifically, they come from the Moluccan Islands. Uh, very oddly, uh, there's a very sizable feral population in Taiwan of all places. Um, again, I have to think that bird, the birds were brought there and then released and they managed to reproduce. Enough of them were released that they could reproduce because that's really the only sizable feral population outside of Indonesia. And uh, I bet, well, I probably don't even have to ask that, you know, the umbrella cockatoo is from the Moluccan Islands, but obviously also is the Moluccan cockatoo. So Moluccan cockatoo is not the only cockatoo from the Moluccan Islands. All right, which is true of umbrella cockatoos? I don't know if anybody here has an umbrella, but. A, they eat crickets and lizards in the wild. B, Fred the cockatoo from Breda was an umbrella cockatoo. C, unlike other cockatoos, they're pure white. And D, because they're long-lived birds, sexual maturity isn't reached until five to six years of age. 
Chris, they all sound like they could be true. Okay, most of you pick that sexual maturity isn't reached until five to six years of age. And the answer, you might not want to hear this, is that they eat crickets and lizards in the wild. Uh, most, if not all, parrots do eat insects. I know probably that isn't something you want to hear. And my cockatiel pepper, for example, loves those pantry moth larvae. He smacks his beak when he sees them and he gobbles them up. Tulip. My cocktail tulip, on the other hand, recoils in disgust if he sees uh, a moth larvae. I have tried to feed pepper mealworms and he doesn't like those, but umbrella cocktails will actually catch crickets and eat whole lizards in the wild, which is kind of crazy. Now here's a picture of Fred the cockatoo. Uh, unfortunately, all the uh, full color pictures were copyrighted, but I found this one. Fred the cockatoo is actually three different cockatoos. Um, most commonly played by one uh, female called Lala, because she liked to say la 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 la, as cockatoos do. But she was um, actually a silver crested cockatoo, not an umbrella cockatoo. And while they look pure white to us, if you look at umbrella really close, you'll see very pale yellow on the wings and tails when they, uh, when they fly. So they're not 100% white. Uh, they do reach sexual maturity, however, at age three to four years, not five to six. So a little bit younger, but it still takes quite a while. And which red list category is the umbrella cockatoo? Least concerned, vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered? Okay, most people guessed vulnerable. And the answer is actually endangered. We don't know the population, but there aren't that many of them. Again, a lot of the issue was trapping for the pet trade. Uh, unfortunately, in Indonesia, unlike in Australia, things are not well regulated and there's still a tremendous amount of trapping for the pet trade going on. All right, and this is our last bird, the cherry-headed conure, known in the rest of the world as the red masked conure which makes a lot of sense because they do have a red mask around their face. So I actually think that's a better name for them. And where are they from? Western Hemisphere, Asia, Africa, or Australasia? Okay, and everybody guessed Western Hemisphere and they are correct. Which part of the Western Hemisphere? North America, Central America, South America, or Central and South America? Okay, the majority guessed Central America, and the answer is again, South America. A little trickier, which country are they native to? Ecuador, Peru, Brazil, or Ecuador and Peru. Okay, we're basically split between Brazil and Ecuador and Peru. And the answer is Ecuador and Purdue, Peru. They're found along the coast here in this area that goes between, it's mostly Ecuador, but a little bit into Peru. Now, cherry-headed conures have established feral populations everywhere but California, oops, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, or Mexico. Which state or which state or country are they not? established as feral birds in. Okay, the majority said Hawaii, and you would be wrong. The answer is Mexico. There are cherry-headed conures in Hawaii. Again, have to have been brought out there and released because there's no way a parrot is flying from California to Hawaii. 
Oddly, they're not in Mexico, but they are in California, Florida, and Puerto Rico. They're also, there's also a feral population in Spain. Again, had to have been brought out there. This should be an easy one. Which film made Cherry Headed Conyers famous? Holly, Wild Parrots of Telegraph yeah. Hill, Winged Migration, or Rio? Hopefully everyone gets this one right. And you did. The answer is, of course, Wild Parrots of Telegraph Hill. And this is a fabulous movie. Uh, Mark Bittner started feeding the cherry head Conyers. And there were a few other types of Conyers in there too, uh, along with the cherry head, but the cherry head are the, are the most famous. And um, Polly, uh, gosh, no, I'm blanking. I think it was a Pionis. No, 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 I'm sorry. It was a uh, a blue-capped Conyer, right, right. I think it was a blue-capped Conyer, which, or blue-headed Conyer, which were also wild parrot of Telegraph Hill. Wing migration was all um, non-parrots, and Rio basically was uh, based on the Spix's macaw. By the way, if you've, if you've seen the movie but haven't read the book, I strongly recommend the book. The book is very different from the movie and includes tons of stories that aren't in the movie. So they complement each other. It's not just a movie of the book. So I strongly, strongly recommend see, seeing both the movie and reading the book. And finally, whoops, which red list category is the cherry-headed conure? Least concerned, near threatened, vulnerable, or endangered? Okay, and the majority said least concerned. And actually the answer is near threatened. There are only 2,500 to 99.99 of them, we believe in the wild. So they're not as common as we thought and they are at risk like most parrots are from habitat loss. And here is the obligatory photo credits, uh, not meant to be read, but uh, these are the credits for everything that you saw in the presentation. And that's it. We will stop the share. And if anyone has any comments or wants to say anything before, before we finish up, um, I hope you found it fun and educational. If not, let me know. Uh, if you have any improvements, if you saw any typos, let me know. Because again, this is the first time I'm doing this presentation. Thank you for the work you put in. Oh, you're welcome. And have uh, I'd be curious to know how many of you have seen wild parrots, seen parrots in the wild. Ginny, obviously, I know you have. You've been with mm -hmm. me for the time. Um, Maureen, I know you've seen uh, feral parrots. Um, you can go ahead and talk. Anyone cannot, Anyone wants to unmute themselves. In fact, I'm just going to stop the recording now, actually.